Meeting of the Linmar School Board will be called to order at 5 p.m. in the boardroom of the Learning Resource Center. Will you please take roll to determine a quorum? Here. 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 Walker. Here. Wall. Here. And Weaver. Here. Thank you. Second. I have a motion by Rachel and a second by Clark. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, before we open the floor for audience communication this evening, I want to address the events of the last board meeting. Since I know some are here this evening to tell me and the rest of the board, that the removal of a disruptive individual from the meeting was wrong and that they should have been allowed to speak and ask questions. These meetings are a place of business for this district. They are governed as all official meetings of government are run, by, be it a school board, a city council, or the legislature, by rules stipulated not only through district policy by, but by state law. The board must follow the set agenda as presented to the community. The board must not engage in dialogue with the audience because of this set meeting agenda. Board meetings are held in view of the public, but are not for the public to have an active role. This is a business meeting. The public has every right to witness these meetings. However, outside of the specific time set aside for audience communications, the public cannot be an active participant in these meetings. It is the responsibility of the board president to maintain order and ensure that the business of the district is conducted in an efficient and orderly manner. If members of the audience become disruptive and refuse to cease their actions after being asked, they will be deemed out of order and asked to leave and or removed if necessary, as stated in policy. There are many ways to communicate with the district. You can call or email your student's teacher or building administrator. You can email the district administration and you can email the board. You can also come to these meetings and participate in the public segment of the meeting designated as audience communications. What the public is not allowed to do is speak out, insert themselves, or otherwise become disruptive within the course of the meeting. This behavior is disrespectful and will not be tolerated. Some here tonight may not like these opinions. Some have stated that you get no response when you email or that you have not heard. Let me be clear on that. Messages of disrespect, messages that threaten the board or the district, or that are simply filled with hate speech have no place here and will not be given a response. Messages that have questions that are answered, by the person within the district that is most appropriate to the topic at hand. The board provides policy and oversight, but the board does not govern the day-to-day -day operations of the district and therefore is most often not the one to answer the questions submitted. We do read your emails, we do listen to your comments, but there are many different views in this community and there is a difference between not getting an answer and not getting the answer you want. In education, we strive to set examples for our students. One of these examples is the behavior expected in civilized society the way we treat one another, the way we speak to one another. It would be best if everyone can remember that our students are watching how we treat one another and they are watching the examples we set and the respect that we have for rules and procedures. With that said, I will now open the floor to audience communication. Those who have signed up to speak, I will call in the order that you have signed up. We will receive your comments and acknowledge those are, and acknowledge but not engage in a dialogue with the speaker because of the set agenda. Your remarks are limited to three minutes per speaker and should be shared in a respectful manner. Jim Green. Good evening, board members. I'm Jim Green, I'm a community member, and as you all know, I am president of the IESB Board of Directors. And I'm here to talk about item 501 on the agenda, but I know you're gonna talk, but I have three things. First of all, I wanna thank Britt, because she attended the Q&A uh, we had online a week ago to try to understand and make sure she could convey to you what IESB is asking of your representative to the, new, the special delegate assembly that's coming up tomorrow evening. I'll be in Des Moines for that. Uh, number two, I want to let you know I am here and if there are more questions as you discuss item 501, I'd be happy to answer those. If there's any confusion, I'm sure you're, you're pretty well brief by now, but if there's anything else that comes up, uh, let me know. And number three, I wanted to let you all know that I really firmly believe that what IASB is asking by changing our bylaws is important, it's necessary, and uh, Britt's got all the background on that, and I think you'll probably talk about that a little more. But I'll stick around until you get done with that item. Thanks.
Hello, I am a parent of two Linmar students and a taxpaying neighbor, and just wanted to share a few words of support for the board, administrators, and especially the staff and parents who continue to prioritize all our students and their overall well being. Students' well being refers to psychological, cognitive, social and physical functioning and capabilities that students need for a fulfilling life, a life beyond K through 12th education. Thank you for continuing to partner with parents to ensure we can all contribute to supporting their well-being and in turn, our community's well-being. Jim Thatcher, Linmar School Board resident. I'll send emails supporting the statements I make. My comments are directed to six out of eight of you. Barry and Matt are exempted. If I were to grade this board, I'd give you an F. As public servants, as it relates to the handling of Linmar policies 50413. First, the board didn't tell the truth to the public or the news media about these policies. You've seen my emails on the topic. Next, the board had 60 plus speakers in opposition to the policies not counting many more in opposition, which didn't speak. Those numbers are also evidence that you didn't do your job. I, if I had those numbers in front of City Rapids City Council, they would have rightfully sent me back to the drawing board, taking no action on the topic. When your job's done right, you should have less than a handful of people in opposition. Yes, you can hide behind your statement the policy meetings were open to the public, and that doesn't fly with me, because if you did your job correctly, you would have sought they're called stakeholders. You would have sought all stakeholders in that for those meetings. Next, after the opposition spoke, you had opportunity to, at the very least, table the issue for further consideration. Again, you showed pu poor public service judgment, voted them in anyway. You can hide behind statements that we had no choice. It was the law. The attorney told us to. But again, that doesn't negate the fact that it is your job to consider all aspects of the issue before your vote. You've hurt a significant number of people in your jurisdiction and it appears to me you don't care. People who hurt emo tend to emotionally respond in ways that aren't necessarily the best. You, the reason you have a significant number of folks in opposition to this board and why you're experiencing at least one lawsuit is because you didn't do your job right. With legal actions flying, your attorney should have advised this board no one's to discuss any matters pertaining to 50413, that your attorney will handle the questions themselves. That's correct. Do not talk to anybody about it. When you do a poor job, your attorney's out front attempting to defend your actions. When you do your job well, the attorney will be behind you because you did your job well. You made these statements to the public prior to the policies. Quote, the policies will not change any practice the school district has been following the last five years. Quote, if we voted no tonight, these policies still would have to fo be followed. So rescind 50413 and your self-inflicted conflict and legal actions and costs will end quickly. I can't believe I made it in three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Reverend Gary Sneller. Hello, I am Reverend Gary Sneller, a resident, voter, taxpayer in the school district, retired pastor with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and co-leader of Stand in Unity, a Lynn County Faith Coalition working for racial equity and social justice in our communities. I'm not here tonight to speak for or against the reputation or integrity of any company or person with whom you have or intend to contract for specific services. The reputation and integrity of those companies and persons can readily be verified by any reasonable person via an internet search, and I trust that you have done your due diligence in vetting those companies and persons. I'm not here to quote Christian scripture and lecture you about biblical principles of education. After all, even though many of us are people of faith, predominantly Christian faith, public schools are not church Sunday schools and are not private religious schools. American public education by law and by historic contract must consider and incorporate students of all faiths or no faith in making educational decisions. And I'm not here to quote our founding fathers about their understanding of public education. That phrase, founding fathers, 
should be sufficient to indicate that American life and education is not going to be the same in the 21st century America as it was in 17th century America when it was colonized or the 18th century when this nation was created. I simply want to thank you once again for faithfully and conscientiously, courageously fulfilling your civic duty as public stewards of education for the Lynn Mar School District. Please remain steadfast in this great public responsibility, always remembering that all of you were elected by district voters by thousands of votes to undertake this important responsibility. Thank you for being good public servants. And uh, Erlinson. Hi. I'm a taxpayer, and I had three daughters that went to Linmar, and we've always been happy with Linmar. So I am here to thank the administrators, the teachers, and you board members for the hard work you've done. And just continue and try not to relax too much. Thank you. Leah Grief. Grief. Hello. Uh, our, two, our two boys have gone all the way through Linmar. Um, they're so much better for it. And we just want to thank you for everything that you've done and fully support you, support your policies. Um, and just thank you for everything that you've done. Our power. Hello, I'm Kat Power. I too want to thank everybody for the support that you've given for the students that are LGBTQ. Uh, I know that it's not always seen, but they see the decisions that are being made and they know they feel supported by these board decisions. They know it's not easy. Um, they have heard of the things that have been said to you and, and things like that, and they also face hard times as well, as far as in the hallways with homophobic and transphobic remarks um, that are not easy to be dealt with on, by any age of any person. Um, so thank you for the support that you have shown them and the continued support that um, they feel by you guys. Kurt Hancock. Kurt Hancock, Mount Vernon. First of all, biblical values are true today just as they were years ago when they were first written or given to us. Abraham Lincoln was credited with saying that the philosophy in the schoolhouse today will be the philosophy in government in the next generation. America was founded on biblical philosophy, on biblical principles, and that is irrefutable in an open and honest discussion. I'm 70 years old, and I was rightfully taught the biblical philosophy in elementary public school because that is our nation's foundation. I was not taught the Christian religion. I was taught the biblical principles and philosophy this nation was founded on. But in the 1960s, God and the Bible were taken out of public school and replaced with a secular humanist worldview. I was there, I saw it. Now, three generations later, our nation is governed by two competing worldviews, the secular humanist as well as the biblical. The secular humanist says man is the ultimate authority. The biblical says God is. My problem is that public schools only teach the secular humanist worldview. They teach our children to ignore the biblical worldview and teach our children to reject biblical principles. And if you doubt me, check the transgender policy right here. With no exposure to biblical values in public schools, the secular humanist worldview will become dominant and that will fundamentally change America. To stop this, our public schools must return to teaching the principles this nation was founded on. 
So how do we do that? Four easy steps. First, speaking in every school board meeting and talking about our founding principles. Second, find those school board members having a biblical worldview and support them. Third, find effective candidates having a biblical worldview, convince them to run for school board and work to get them elected. Fourth, find local state house and senate candidates having a biblical worldview and work to get them elected. Returning to the philosophy this nation was founded on is really that easy. But for most, it will mean stepping out of the boat. I know. Thank you, and more to come. Gage West. Hello, Lindmar School Board. My name is Gage West. I'm a Marion taxpayer <coughs> in Proud, Iowa. I first want to say thank you to all the individuals who put the liberty, constitution, and education first. I simply want to ask a question. When is enough enough? When is the lack of transparency enough? When is the lack of respect and honesty for parents and taxpayers and constituents enough? This board has continually ignored questions, concerns, and different opinions, and I'm here to say that as we as taxpayers in Iowa have had enough. Please stop with the politically motivated tactics. As adults, there should not be any reason you as a board should be using children as pawns. Every week I hear about students being silenced and harassed by teachers and the staff at this district, and that is not okay. I'm extremely disappointed in Lindmar schools. I remember this district being the district in Eastern Iowa every school wanted to be like, and that sadly isn't the case anymore. You as a board are costing taxpayers thousands of dollars because of your irresponsible decisions passing radical policies. Because your decisions, now our district is in a lawsuit and we're footing the bill. I'm very concerned with the lack of accountability and transparency with President Mori and her belief that she is above ordinary citizens. Enough is enough. To the parents, grandparents, taxpayers, small business owners, and concerned citizens of Marion, if you live in the district and are concerned, I encourage you to get involved. Lindmar School Board works for us. We voted them in, and we can vote them out. Thank you. Tiffany DeBeau. Hello, board. Um, I want to start off first by saying I pretty much stand in opposition to a lot of the people here saying that they don't hear responses, and they think that it's just them that doesn't hear responses. I also don't get responses, because I realize there's only so much you can respond to. So no, everybody in the district, you're not being selectively chosen on who gets responses. Second, I want to start by saying thank you so much, all of you who've been on the board and have done work here through the school district and all you who, you who ran this past cycle and ran. We understand as a community that you have volunteered to be elected to have yourselves elevated to a position above private, private citizen to public official. And with that comes extra scrutiny and responsibilities that makes your position different than ours. So I appreciate you all for stepping up to do that. One thing I want to say as a parent in this district, um, liberty, the definition is the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. So as a mother in this district, thank you very much for preserving my liberty by offering my children opportunities and options and giving me a choice to be able to opt them out if I disagree with anything that is coming. That is my liberty as a parent to determine what they should be exposed to, not your liberty as a board to block them from certain things. So thank you for protecting our liberty in the district. Um, I will also say as a parent in the district, I know I'm not alone in how I am not pleased that now we have a nationally syndicated political action committee going to be getting involved in our school district. So I encourage you all in the days ahead when you hear comments and hear certain things in the district, be sure to check where those are coming from because the administrator of that group isn't even this in this state, one of the administrators. So keep in mind going forward that it's not necessarily Linmar players who are doing the talking. We did the talking when we voted in November 2021 and that shows what this district wants. Thank you. Barb Johnson. I'm Barb Johnson. I have five kids in this district. What a show you guys have set. Hypocritical opening statement, by the way. Bravo. Uh, I mean, you guys are the perfect role models for the students here at Linmar. Britt, you above average citizen, you gavel and all. Melissa, no mass today. Sandra, did you even read the agenda this week? Shannon, which one of them has your strings? 
And Rachel, are we in for more patronizing and degrading words from you today? I mean, I'm sure we are because this is how this joke of a board operates. Ignore the parents, neglect the kids. But don't worry, guys, it won't take up too much of your time. After all, we need to leave room for that gavel for you to call in your submissive SRO, SRO plaything, and obviously some more time for Rachel to mean mad about something that she couldn't possibly find a common ground on, let alone just be nice and decent, but I'm sure that's how you treat people who don't share your beliefs. I'll leave you guys to deal with your lawsuits and insurance claims, and I don't know if you guys are aware of how long your ropes are with the district on a legal level. Little piece of advice, I'd get your personal lawyers and insurance now. Once the district decides they're done covering your pathetic behinds, that money's coming straight out of your own pocket, so ante up. I mean, you guys really thought we weren't serious when we said you should resign. Looks like you're gonna need all the luck you can get. And as far as the resident toddler tantrum taxpayer, it's very clear you are of an uneducated and angered mind. I mean, in 2016, you couldn't even vote correctly when running for auditor and would have been arrested. But that arrest came in 2018, another great year for you. Maybe you'll remember the assault and harassment charges. And since it seems we, need, we feel the need for Marxist word usage, uh, <clears throat> without the right context, maybe go buy a dictionary and look in the mirror. And one last reminder, since it's always a political debate to which has no place in a nonpartisan school board meeting, here are some names you should remember. Frank McCord, Richard Reed, John Lester, John Kennedy, Calvin Jones, and James Crow. You may remember these wonderful Democratic members to which you hold so dear. I'll let you reminisce about those deplorables. I'm sorry taking your words, humans who have helped found an organization your party supports. But hey, the rest of us are not seasoned bigots, aren't we, Joe? Good evening, board. Um, my name's Gretchen Lawyer, and I'm a community member. I just wanted to say that as this uh, new school year has begun, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the board the staff and administrators for their past and continuing commitment <coughs> to creating equitable and inclusive spaces in the Linmar School District. And why are these efforts so important? <coughs> so that every student can feel safe, included, and know that they matter. Inclusiveness is important to success at school and to life in general. So that's why it's important for the district to continue to focus on students' needs through social emotional learning opportunities and diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. This helps foster a sense of belonging so that all students um, can succeed and it's what all students deserve. Go Stotler. Good evening, I'm Joe Stutler. I'm a parent of, of, of children who've graduated from the district, combat veteran who paid for your freedoms. I pay taxes here as I live in the district, I'm a citizen. About 24 hours ago, I was just getting back from Washington, D.C., where I was out working with veterans and military families, elected officials, uh, non-government organizations, allies, and so on, to try and make our country a better place, more freedom and liberty for all. Had a little bit of free time and uh, wandered down to the National Mall and got to see the Vietnam Veterans Memorial with a buddy of mine who showed me on, on the wall where his buddy is, guy who died in his arms. Saw a friend of mine's brother's name on the wall, so on. World War II Memorial, Korean Memorial, so on and so forth. And I had a bit of an epiphany. I, I had a moment of, of clarity, of a rather conservative revelation, in fact, as I thought about what all these men and women died for, what all of us have fought for. And, and I realized that, you know, according to my oath, support and defend, foreign and domestic, sometimes we need walls. Sometimes we need walls for defense. So I would highly recommend to the board that we implement a wall here, that we restrict the discussions, this public comment period, parents who live in the, parents who have children in the district and citizens who live in the district. These outsiders, these foreign types that are coming in and attacking our children, our teachers and staff, our administrators, our board, our community members. We have a hard enough time defending against those 
domestic variety, be they the gerbils, the shouty mans, the um, bubble hutted bleach blonde who comes on at five and represents us in Congress now. Implement a policy. And I would ask that you use ID cards to verify who they are because ID is important, apparently. I would ask, uh, Madam Chair, I would ask that you add me a few more minutes. I'm getting a lot of conversation back here. The House is not in order. If there are comments being come from the audience, you cannot speak during someone else's time. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that's my recommendation to you. And I would like to thank you for doing your jobs conscientiously, thinking it through, and taking care of all of our children not just the select few that happen to be of a certain faith or philosophical perspective. Thank you. God save our troops. Go Lions. Tracy Berta. Hello. Um, I'm Tracy Berta, and I'm a mom in the district. I've had five kids, and our youngest is a sophomore. I just have a request. And that is if you would maybe consider doing a later time for school board meetings. 5 p.m. is so hard to get here. I'm here with a wet head tonight because I needed to get a shower before I came. And um, I know my husband would like to attend at times. And 5 o'clock is just a really, really early time for people who are working. And so my request is maybe even if it were 5.30, um, that 30 minutes would just so help because I know there are a lot of parents who would like to come and attend and listen and even speak but it's hard to get here always by five o'clock so my request is um, a consideration for a later time for school board meetings thank you thank you to everyone who came this evening that will conclude audience communications and we'll move on to informational reports discussions and presentations <coughs> First up, we have facilities planning update, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Viscard. We'll give OPN a chance to move forward um, to, the, um, to the computer screen here in just a minute, but we're glad to have uh, three of our representatives from OPN, uh, Roger Worm, uh, Vicki Highland, and Alicia Horsfall. They've been working through us with us on all of our um, projects uh, that we're currently working on, including the new administrative building. Um, it's been a, a long process with lots and lots of rounds of feedback and um, design inf our information back and forth. So we're at a point where we're really excited to, to kind of share some of the initial designs and just keep in mind that nothing is final yet. This is still very much a work in progress. Um, we feel like we're at a good point though to, to share our current design. So looks like Roger's up at the mic first. So we'll hand it over to you and your team. Very good. Thank you, Shannon. Nice to be here again, everyone. I'm Roger Worm. Along with me is Alicia Horsfall. Yeah, we're excited to give you a kind of a sneak peak update of where we've been here the last few weeks or last few months rather in developing the administration project it's been a it's been a fun one we've always enjoyed our work here in the district and continue to uh, to forge ahead with our work and our arrows I'll do this one there we go um, high level view so if you've not been out to the site just east of Excelsior it's an amazing site. It's, it's got to be one of the best sites that, that we've been a part of, partly because it sits up high above Tower Terrace. If you get an opportunity to go out there and just walk to where the building will be, when you look to the southwest <coughs> uh, towards the stadium, which is the lower left, you have this amazing view into the stadium, through the stadium, up to the north side of the high school. Just a phenomenal view. It's like when you go to a hotel and you open up the the, the curtains and you go, wow, what a great view. This has kind of that, that very dynamic feel. On the site, just east of the tennis courts, we started to, to understand how did we want to position the building? Where, where are those views? And again, the arrows that point to the lower left point down towards the stadium to the lower right point past the aquatic center and out into the wooded field. So the, the views to the southwest, south, and southeast are phenomenal. We want to really take advantage of them. As we did several test fits, this is an example of one, is how do you experience not only the view, but lay the building out? We've got essentially two major programs. One is the 
administration side, offices and such, and the other side is building services. So we started with the concept of splitting the, the building clearly with a lobby in the middle and started to lay out options of having the, the administrative services to one side and the building services to the other. So this is a concept plan where we are now and it's, it's starting to really come together in pretty nice shape. Um, very simple, super simple construction, very, very straightforward. There's nothing fancy here with curves or, or complicated structure. And I think the biggest thing right now, as many of you know, the, the building environment and our bidding environment rather is just, it's, it's a tough time budget wise. Things are so darn expensive and we, we all experience that in any number of ways. So we've taken a very straightforward approach in the plan. The, uh, the line in the middle, I don't know if this has a pointer on it. No. Okay. So the purple rectangle that you see in the middle is the lobby. That's essentially the, the dividing line of the building. Uh, that first blue box to your up to the right of that is HR. And then moving around clockwise, we have volunteer communications in the upper right is student support. And then the lower right in the green is administration. Business office is the dark blue. Nutrition is kind of a brown. And then the boardroom is on the lower lower left. So everything along the bottom side of that, that plan focuses back across the district. It's just a, it's a, nice, a nice vignette of what you see when you look out the window and all day, every day, you get to enjoy the Linmar campus. And then up on the building services side, there's cooler and freezer on the far up left in the brown. Uh, archives and then information technology offices on the, on the right side. <clears throat> and there's an idea of how we're, we're looking at it sitting on the site with the floor plan, conceptual parking for daily operations as well as uh, back of house entry for services that come into the, into the building. And then a snapshot of, of a concept drawing looking at it from Tower Terrace. This would be just to the southeast of the building. The darker wing to the right is the office area. And then the, the red box to the left that, that projects out is the boardroom. Aerial view from the northeast looking out towards the stadium. And again, it's just, it's an exciting site. It, it, this is a fantastic site. And then coming in from the north that picture window looks right through the lobby out the south side of the building. South side of the building, we've got a little outdoor area off of the uh, break room. And then also shade the windows with sunshades. And then a shot of the lobby itself. So we're still looking at super graphics, but pretty straightforward plan. Any questions on, on this? Alicia, anything you want to add? Is the, um, the current number of offices, is this based on our current needs? Is it based on future growth needs? Kind of where are we at in terms of that? It's essentially a blend of both. It's what do you need now and how do you maximize your current efficiency, but also a, a bit of a crystal ball of different programming um, components that are, that are you know, wound into this. We've gone through the program, well, every, every meeting we've got together, we've gone through the building program of, all the spaces, how big, how many, and we've, I think we've distilled that pretty well to pare it down to what we need. There are a couple of other small office areas that could be potential um, additional staff spaces as well, and then we talked about um, different options within the building if we ever needed to add on, where would be the natural places to do that, and I think okay. OPN's still kind of tweaking that based on the layout with the land as well, and then also um, natural um, connection areas for the building too. So there is some um, at least projected opportunity for growth and expansion on this building site if we were to need additional office space down the line. Okay. Correct. Now, is there removable walls that we can either uh, add to or close up depending on, on the growth and how fast the growth may take? Oh, for the building. Huh? For the building. Oh, 
Yeah. Three people. Your office can handle three people. <laughs> Could you um, show us like the entrance uh, again? Is that come off at Tower Terrace? Now, what, could you show us where that is? It comes off of Winslow, doesn't it? So yeah. the new road, Clark, that we just put in behind Excelsior, that connects Excelsior and Winslow Road, um, that is where the entrance to the school will come in um, from the north, essentially, right there. Oh, from As the you north. can see, okay. Tower Terrace Road, that where that dead end is on the far right side, is the current dead end. Um, there is no access to the administration building from that location. You have to go up along Winslow and then um, the backside to Excelsior to enter the, the administration building from there. If you remember okay. when we were doing the extension for Excelsior, the city wouldn't let us do another exit right. onto Tower Terrace or onto 10th, so it had to go on Winslow. So that would be the same road for this building. Okay, dokie. I'm going to go back to Clark's first question about the remo removable walls as well, the movable walls. Roger, at least if you go back to that, the border in that one, thank you. The border room Roger mentions in the bottom left hand section, it's really much more than the board room, but that's um, that section there. You can see the on the left hand side there's a slight curvature. That's where the chair, the furniture, that's where the, the board table will be essentially. And then you can't see it from here, but there's a, a wall right there essentially that um, during normal business hours most of the time, to the right of that, there are three rooms that can be used as either smaller meeting rooms or the walls can be moved and collapsed and have either one larger room or uh, two rooms that are decent sized as well. So um, there's some flexibility in that, trying to be efficient with the space. We didn't want to have a full large boardroom and not be used for meeting rooms as well. Uh, so try to give some flexibility how that could look um, for board meetings and for staff trainings and meetings and everything else that happen throughout the day. What's the total capacity of that room? Ooh, I'll look back to Alicia for that. 100, 100. 100 um, uh, visitors uh, plus okay. the, the board and the cabinet. Can you go back to the overhead? To the exterior? Yeah, yeah well, the uh, bird's eye view, kind of. You're drawing and the, the other one. one, or the one after. Nope. Back the other way. One more. Site plan. Yeah, the site plan. There you go. Oh. I couldn't think of the word. This one? Right there. Uh, the southeast, I guess it would be the southeast corner there. Uh, looks like there's a parking lot. And then it, there's kind of a T there in the lower left corner. Is that, I'm assuming that's parking lot? Fire truck access to get around that building. Okay, okay. I, didn't, it, I was wondering if that was for future planning of different entrance or exit, but that makes sense, thanks. That's a good question because you know, if you notice most of our elementary and intermediate buildings, a lot of them have a, a road around the entire building. We're fortunate the size of this building does not need to have that, but um, they're still, without having that little turnaround spot, that was not going to meet the fire code for that piece of it too. So, um, so that's kind of the intent of what that looks like. But luckily, we don't have to have the full trail all the way around the building. Is there enough parking. <laughs> The reason for that is the the square footage. So much of the build, the number of parking spots is determined by square footage of the building, yes, correct? Yes. And since so much of the building is um, storage for either IT or curriculum materials or all the freezer and storage for nutrition services as well, um, that square footage doesn't lead to more people needing to be in parking spots. So that's the re the rationale for the request for the variance. Um, in the event that we would not uh, receive that variance, um, would we have space there to add on park have, to parking? Yes, we have space. As you can see, we're, we're pulling the parking a little bit away from 
in the building to give it some green space. And we need to put green space on <coughs> the north side of the services <coughs> wing of the building where we could add additional parking. But we don't want to leave the old site. We want to leave as much green space as we can. I appreciate the multi-purpose functionality in the design. The idea that the boardroom is only a boardroom, you know, twice a month. Um, so that that space can be used daily for multiple activities, I think is great. And I like, um, one of the questions I had asked when I looked at it first was about the expansion, kind of where Melissa was going, and knowing that some of the conference rooms have been pre-planned, that they could be converted to office space. Like, I appreciate the forethought in that design, because we don't want to build a building bigger than what we need, but we also don't want it just right, so that we have nowhere to, to expand. Um, so I appreciate the thought that went into it. I also appreciate um, you listening and not, you know, <laughs> our schools need to be beautiful. Um, this building needs to be pretty. And I think the distinction is, you know, we don't need this to be a castle on a hill. We need it to be functional for our, our staff. And we appreciate you reflecting that in the design. I do appreciate that. I think probably a comment to make too on top of that it's actually freeing up space in this facility for high school expansion as well, which it's being utilized, you know, so that's really one of the reasons for driving this forward more so than anything. This space is getting crowded as well because of that. So. It's very much the reason for all of this. That's a good point to bring up because once we move to this new facility, all of these rooms here, rooms five and six next door, the entire second floor, those all become access spaces for high school and compass programs to, um, to expand as well. So. Uh, the other piece that uh, I'd want to bring up as well is you know, Roger kind of alluded to it in his opening remarks about you know, it's just a tough market right now to get a good handle on cost of everything, um, you know, the inflation, just the demands. Um, so we are hoping to have some budget numbers for you at this time, but we're just not at that point yet because of the, the volatility of the market with everything. So, um, so we'll hope in the next couple of weeks to a month we'll come back with more specific information in that regard and then maybe you know, if we have more um, fine tune or tweaks to do for this building as well before we take the next steps towards um, the bidding process. I like the fact, Roger, that we got some flexibility in there, but I also uh, want to say with the prices that you've already alluded to, I appreciate the fact that OPN is looking um, for uh, the most functional pricing that we could get uh, as far as the materials that we use. Um, we don't want the top, to, to, bleh, excuse me, Taj Mahal type of approach, but we want something that is functional and uh, is as aesthetic as, as we can afford. And I, I appreciate that because I know that the cost of materials are ridiculous, no matter if you're building a shed in your backyard or if, if you're building a building. And, and we do appreciate all the hard work that you guys are going through to, to try and find the best that, that we can deal with. And I appreciate that immensely. Thank you. Anyone have any other questions about something you, you're not seeing that you thought you would see in the plans? Now's the time for us to kind of give that feedback before they go on to their next phase. I think they've done a good job of listening to us over the time and suggestions we've made. Appreciate that it, it, as others have said, it doesn't look, you know, like a Taj Mahal, but it looks like a nice building that is attractive that somebody would want to be in. Um, it looks like it was well thought out in the planning, and um, I appreciate that you listened to all of us. Good job. Thank you. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you so much for coming, and we thank look you. forward to the next, next update. update. Uh, next up is our hiring update from Carla. been a fun year for staffing um, in our office. It's been incredible. So uh, I just wanted to give an overview of the number of people that we've hired, the number of people we're still looking for, and some of the things that we're doing to try to attract and retain people um, here in the district. So 
first off, new teachers, I just wanted to do kind of a huge overview of numbers. Um, we hired 13 uh, general education teachers for elementary, um, five special education, and two open positions still in elementary. Um, intermediate, we hired two general ed. They had a pretty good, pretty good year with only needing two. Middle school, we hired eight. High school, we hired 12 and six of special education. So just a little bit of a breakdown. High school and elementary, they both had 18 positions to fill. So, and 25% of our teacher hires were special education. So, and honestly, that was the hardest um, position we had to fill with special education. Um, actually, Kim Belt at the high school did a great job. She dug and she dug and she dug and she did find some people. I think she maybe talked a few people into it, but that's okay. They're in the classroom um, and they're excited to be there. So. She did a great job. We did hire two nurses and nine district support. Um, district support is just basically backfilling. Um, the CFO with Dave, um, we hired a replaced Tanya's position for associate athletic director, and we had some new principals and facilitators. So those aren't new positions, but we just had to backfill those. Classified is a different story. <clears throat> we have 14 new student support associates. We have five new secretaries, which is kind of unheard of um, in the district. We have a new BD assistant, and we'd hired seven bus drivers. Um, when you look at the openings, we have 37 openings for classified staff right now. Um, we have 28 student support associates. Uh, Nutrition Services is looking for six. We have one secretary, um, an HVAC, and a paraprofessional open. And bus drivers, we're always, we always have openings for bus drivers. It's hard to say um, how many exactly we have at one time. Um, we did have a lot of student support associates resign um, probably two weeks, one week before school started. Mm -hmm. So that was a challenge. Um, and then we do have some new positions that we need to fill to cover students' needs. So. That's why that number is so high for student support associates. So really classified staff, as you can see, uh, accounted for 50% of our hires. And of that amount, 40% was for associates. So we really are in, in dire need for associates. Um, all things considered, though, when you look at our numbers, we're doing pretty well uh, for our teaching staff. Um, there's a lot of districts that have a lot more openings than what we have right now. So we're in a decent holding spot right now. So I'm gonna take you on a journey, the employee journey, just two parts of it today. So I'm gonna highlight recruiting, what we've been doing, um, and then retention and how we're trying to keep our staff here and happy. So recruiting used to be pretty, um, pretty easy for Linmar. Um, and probably other schools. So um, it's a little bit different now. So certified, um, we locally work with all of our local universities, Iowa universities. Um, out of state, we used, um, we have an online platform that we had uh, virtual job fairs. Um, we use that with uh, Tennessee State, Lincoln University in Missouri, Langston State in Oklahoma. Um, we targeted these specific colleges um, they have good teaching programs, and then they wouldn't have such a shock with um, the Midwest weather that I hear is going to be really, really good this year. Um, probably not. Unfortunately, we did not have a lot of um, participation uh, from those colleges, um, so we'll keep trying on that. We did, like I said, um, special education teachers was a struggle, so we did offer them um, a bonus to all of our special ed new hires. Um, or payment for to get the endorsement. So um, I think we only had two that we are paying for endorsements right now. Um, again, kind of unheard of, but these are the things we're having to do uh, to get the best um, employees that we can. Um, you all probably know about the grant that we got from the state. So in that program right now, we have 23 participants with Mount Mercy and 28 participants in Kirkwood. Um, so that's been pretty popular and people seem to enjoy that. For classified staff, uh, we did a transportation job fair at the end of June. Um, we had seven 
um, I believe seven attend, and I think we hired three or four of them. Um, it does take five weeks for them to get trained for the CDL, so that's been a little um, hard for Brian to um, keep up with that. Uh, we've grabbed people from our volunteer pool. Um, Carla was not very happy with us at the time, but we, we did grab them. Um, and we are going to have an upcoming associate job fair, so hopefully we can uh, grab some more student support services staff. We've done social media, we've done radio, uh, obviously our website. And moving forward, we're trying to think out of the box, you know, how can we find these people? Um, it's been an interesting uh, adventure in HR this fall. What are we doing to try to keep people? We have um, our employee assistance program. Um, get that up here. Maybe not. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. We'll do that another time. So we do have our employee assistance program, which is free counseling um, for our staff and their family members. Um, they can have up to five free sessions um, for each different event. So that's, that's a nice benefit. Um, a lot of times people will take advantage of their prep time um, or before and after school for that. We do have a wellness platform um, that we've been using and that has also a lot of the physical, mental, um, financial, we're having financial classes, those, those kinds of things. You know, it's a whole person. It's not just somebody here to teach. This is a whole person and we all have our own issues. Um, we do offer Linmar box, which are pretty exciting. Um, ooh. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so we do have Linmore gear. Um, we do hand out uh, bucks for like wellness, for safety, for all those kinds of things. So um, we did get some new gear in this year and it's been pretty popular. Uh, we did just have a professional development um, associate conference. Um, on your tables you have a little bag, a swag bag is what we called it. So everybody got a bag. And then inside is, I didn't bring mine, but it has a Ziploc baggie with a temporary tattoo and a pen and um, sticky notes. So that went over really well. And then they also had their um, folder that they could put in there. And I put this in each of those if you wanted to take a look. There's a listing of all the classes that we had uh, offered all the associates that day. We're going to continue that on. We're going to have different tracks, um, so stay tuned. We're working closely with Lisa's department to um, get that going. We do try to offer out of the box benefits. This year we did offer pet insurance for voluntary, so I uh, could have used that uh, a couple years ago. Um, building recognitions, they do that on an ongoing basis. Again, I talked about safety. We're gonna start some stay interviews this year. Uh, we've done exit interviews over the years to try to find out why people are leaving or leaving a particular building. So now we're going to try to do some state interviews and see why people like it here. Um, and then finally, just last Friday, I talked with Please Pass the Love. They do have an online uh, mental health, um, I guess you call it academy. So they have classes and you can actually get credit as a teacher for those classes. And it's all about mental health and their own well-being. So we're working with them. I don't have a lot of details yet. Um, again, it was just Friday. So um, those are the things we're doing for retention. Um, any ideas are great. If anybody knows anyone who wants to be a student support associate, you just send them our way. So, any questions? I want to make sure to really highlight the professional development for our associates, the conference that HR and student support services put on. That was quite the event for over two days and the number of opportunities for our uh, classified staff to get some really personalized learning and some choice in what they were doing was, uh, was really fun to see and a, a big step. We've offered training in the past, but it's been more piecemeal hit, hit or miss, but this was uh, more of a full conference format and uh, very successful. So thanks to both of you and your teams for making that happen. It was yeah. um, a step in the right direction to help people uh, really engage with their work and also hopefully retain and keep them and develop them. So on exit interviews for associates that this was one of the things that um, maybe one of the biggest things that they talked about was feeling like they needed more training. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this is incredible. And I also just 
think that um, we do a lot of focus on our teachers, which is so important, but you know, we really need to send the message that these positions are just as important. And I know that every teacher uh, that works for this district would say the same thing. So I think this was a really excellent place to do those mm -hmm. things together. One of the great things is we had actually, we had Casey from my department do kind of a, a wellness session. Uh, first session, I don't think people realized it was like for their own. So then the second session, there was like over 60 people in this little room. I couldn't even get in there. So they really enjoyed it and they were really excited that they were able to do that. So we're gonna continue that on a track. So that was really fun for Casey to do too. So it was a good time. Um, I first wanna say thank you for um, doing what you're doing here. I actually had a conversation with Shannon today regarding some of this with the associates specifically, so this was very, very timely. Um, I did notice, I think the numbers were 23 and 28 with the two colleges for the participation mm -hmm. program. That is phenomenal, you know, 50 people in that sounds like it is certainly on track to be a success. What kind of turnaround time, I guess, would that be to where it starts to help with uh, any issues that we're seeing? and um, does that help with the where where it seems that we're lacking the most in the in the the 37 open positions? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a two-year program. It's a two-year grant. So uh, for Mount Mercy, it's it's a two-year accelerated online, um, and it's elementary um, certifications and special ed. Um, and then for Kirkwood, it's the two-year. It's associates um, degrees and or they can get their para. So they're on their way then to get their teaching degree. So um, I'd say the first time we're gonna see um, anything going on would probably be in two years for that. So to answer your question, not soon enough for the time. Sorry, right? yeah. <laughs> uh, but the positive side is the numbers are great. So we're really right. excited about that. And mm -hmm. stay tuned because um, I believe it's next board meeting or the first one in October. I think it's next one. Um, we have scheduled for Nathan and maybe Phil to come from HR to talk about an update on that grant program and more details on uh, participation, how that's going and timeline, everything else too, because it's not the quick fix we need to help with things, but long term we feel like that's going to be a really beneficial program for us. Can I add really quick on the student side of that one, because I think this will help provide more for you, Matt, too, is um, so we have high school students that are signed up um, in a class and they'll be able to get this um, para certification we'll be able to pay them. So if they have an open period, um, they'll be able to sub and go down into our schools and be Paris, um, and that's gonna start soon. So um, we'll be able to see, and we've already worked with um, what are the closest buildings, like so some students could easily walk to Indian Creek, Novak, other students that are able to travel, um, assisting at the high school with our high school. Um, so that one is gonna come a lot sooner. Thank you. I forgot to mention about me. the student teachers. I can't believe I forgot that. Um, so we have been grabbing student teachers as soon as we can. Um, so last year we grabbed uh, some of the December grads, and so they actually were full-time sub with benefits and everything the second half of the year, which was awesome. So now we're, we're targeting the ones that we have right now. So we're gonna continue to try to do that and to have them to come back, because um, then they were guaranteed a contract for the next year, which was really helpful, and they thought it was great. Um, so we're super excited about that again this year, too. Have you investigated the possibility when trying to find some of those 30-plus positions, looking at the PTOs and for uh, getting them involved and mm -hmm. our big volunteer program? I mean, I'm just trying to throw anything out there that can, can uh, we can contact that maybe they haven't even thought of it yep. or don't know of the situation that we are within the district and to give them some thought to that that uh, maybe we can relieve some of some of the deficit that way I don't know if it can happen but it doesn't hurt to ask oh we're asking a lot of people <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah how many staff does your team have and how much time do they actually have to be able to dedicate to recruitment? Is that, I'm um, just curious. I have the... five. Um, they spend a lot of time, um, we'd like to spend more time on recruiting, 
um, but we have a lot of other things there's, going on. Like it, there's well. just so many other management. Right, we just HR don't have a recruits that. Right, we don't have. So that's what I was curious about was to do that. But we do the best we can yeah. with what we've got. So do they have enough time to be able to do any direct recruitment of like reverse searches on Indeed or? Um, mm -hmm. LinkedIn searches, things like that, or is that, do you just not have the capacity for those kinds of we things? We have done that. Uh, Phil Miller does quite a bit of that. He'll, okay. he'll look out and try to find some things, but he gets caught up with safety and he gets caught up with a lot of other things that, um, but yeah, he tries at least once a week to get out there and see what's going on. Okay. We really are doing some some out of the box thinking and mm -hmm. um, yeah. we have some thank super you. secret yeah. plans, but I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'll ask you after the meeting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great work. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scarlett. Thank you. All right. Um, we have finance audit committee. First one with Dave on board was last week. Barry or Clark, you guys have any comments? Um, I'd like to make a couple comments. Um, you know, the the uh, part of the board that I think is very critical for us, and, and bringing Dave in has helped that. You know, we all have a fiscal responsibility to our constituents, and to change the CFO is a big task. So to bring somebody in like Dave that has the continuity, the long range planning that he has, the conservative voice that he has is very, very critical moving forward. Listening to the folks from the uh, architectural firm is real critical into that because the facility plans, the projections, all of those items are so critical moving forward. And if we don't have the right dollar amount, we don't have the right projections, we're in trouble. So I guess that's just a, first of all, a pat on the back to Dave and, and to really feel good about where we're heading as a board financially. So I, 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 I just think that's real critical as we project out for these building projects and stuff like that. So. Well, um, the only thing that I, I could add to that is that when we uh, lose the CFO and then Dave's coming in here, he does have an understanding of the district and what needs to be done. and with uh, all the problems that we've had with uh, the ransomware and stuff. He's, he's working a lot of overtime to um, get caught up and he's keeping uh, the Linmar, he's keeping the district, you know, uh, aware of what's going on, um, what we need to do before it ha instead of looking back and said we should have done that forward looking and that's been one of our themes for for a long time is moving forward and um you know as we look at the audits and and those types of things you know he's quite aware of that and that really helps instead of reinventing the wheel and starting completely over he's on the ground running uh and hopefully he can catch up and, and do some of those things that, that uh, you know, just need to be done. And uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we got another meeting coming up uh, on the 22nd. And uh, I just like the way that <clears throat> our finances, we know where we're at, know where we want to go. And he's always quite open to listen to, okay, how do we get there? You know, and then that's the that's the type of thing that uh, is is a key for me is the fact that he's aware that we want to move forward as a district, and he's doing everything he can to get us there. So that's. I'll just say it was a really good first meeting, and we kind of all laid the foundation of where we want to be and where we're coming from, and we shared the. Um, our self-assessment on like our fiscal responsibility was one of our strongestly uh, scored areas when we did that. So I shared that with Dave as well. Um, so I just think it was a great first meeting. And Dave, if you want to add anything else. It was helpful to kind of get that, uh, get that information out there and get a guiding light out there in front of me. So we know where we're going to go and making sure I, I do accomplish everything what the board wants to accomplish with the topics we want to cover within the, the committee. 
Um, and so that was a very informative, as much as an informational gathering for myself as to move forward with the committee. It was very helpful. So. Um, can I ask you a quick question on that? Yeah. For the, um, since we're entering into a new school year and as a new school board member, I'm just curious, how often do we see, um, for those of us that aren't on the finance committee, do we see like any like high level financial reports? Is it just the one time <coughs> that, one time a year that you would present the, um, the stuff to the full board? Is that when we kind of see the updates or is there anything else that we see on a more regular basis? Financial statements are included every month in our consent there, agenda. So is it just the, that high level thing, or is there anything else that we discuss more no, often we than No, yeah, there's a couple times a year that we okay. go through it. So is it twice a year? At least twice a year, and your, your timing's perfect for this because um, as we wrap up the fiscal year, 21-22, um, um, typically by September 15th, that is uh, the due date to be finished with that. Uh, we've applied for an extension and have been received that extension, so that's been very helpful. Um, so if not at the next board meeting, the first one in October, Dave will be providing kind of an overview overall as far as um, how we ended the last fiscal year. Okay. And then you'll probably remember uh, for both of you last late January, I believe it was, maybe early February, um, kind of preliminary projections for um, upcoming budget years then as well too. So, okay. so that would be the, the two big things going forward that you'll start to see. Um, in the next couple of months as well. But the first one will be the, the wrap up of last fiscal year um, here very soon. So. Thank you. There should be like a third touch base as well, uh, probably in May with regard to uh, if we need to amend our budget based on how current projections are looking. So we'll, okay. uh, we'll so have another one touch well. base in, in probably in May as well. And then as projects come up, like we're doing facilities, we'll have specifics at, yeah. uh, you know, just on okay, this facility and here's the budget and here's, and so Dave will kind of give updates on that or if we get a certain grant or a certain program. Um, so we do have specific stuff that we talk about throughout the year when it comes up and then like the three big ones. The three bigger times. Yeah. Now. Okay. Thank you. I would think, Melissa, anytime you have a question, you can make an appointment and talk with Dave and figure it out. I mean, sometimes just sitting there and staring at him, it's like, okay, I need, I need to know what this means and this means. Yeah. And once you do, you're good. So Again, don't feel bad the, about that. <laughs> the, the cycle of when these things happen. But I would say. Great question for both of you being new, so I'm glad you asked that so we can clarify it. Thanks. Any other questions for finance audit? Okay, Sandra, you have oh. an update for us from Marion City Council? Yes, on September 8th, the uh, council met and um, really the <coughs> one that hit home the most was there's a, you're asking for um, a hearing for a rezoning, rezoning land that is north of 35th Avenue and east of 34th North Extension. And 35th Avenue, if I, in my brain, that is Boulder Peaks. Correct. Okay, so it is the agricultural part behind that going north that area, okay. So if, if you picture that in your mind, I was looking on maps and making sure I was um, telling you correctly. And there's a, at that point, they would like to, their words, um, it says, they want single family detached residential and a request to rezone property from agriculture to an to SR, which is single, um, single family, single residential, three, to suburb, uh, um, so suburban, me medium density, single family residential. Anyway, what that means is we're getting a lot of single homes <laughs> going north there. And that was the plan. It, it originally was more um, you know, maybe more condos and things like that, and they're asking now for it to be more single family. So that that would be good for us in that we will have more students, but we have to plan for that. How many how many units were they talking? Or how many? They they're just asking for a hearing to rezone. So then they haven't really presented that part yet. But also to to note, there at 35th Avenue. Um, going south, that big open field across from it, it is being built from 
the south end going toward it right now. They're already extending the roads and building more condos and houses. So I would imagine the next couple of years there will be houses on both sides up by Boulder Peak. Is that Peak. going from 35th to 29th Avenue? It'd be 29th, ninth? well, yeah, between 29th and 35th. Yeah, and that going area. how far out, all the way out to the highway? 44th. Oh, to 44th, okay. Yeah, that big open field that's there now. Okay, yep. They're in the process of, of building in that right now. That's interesting because uh, you're talking about the north of Boulder as well, and the, that's what we heard last to spring that a developer was going to start building um, houses east of Boulder Peak uh, right away. We've not seen um, yeah. attraction there there are, either. There so. are rezoning signs up there, though, there now. Are. Yeah. East of there, yeah. 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 So, so everything's kind of in the works, but this was what they're doing is they're um, they are asking for a hearing on the 22nd for that rezoning change. So, well, it's almost 35th. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, in it's between, really it's really going uh, oh, 35th oh, and 44th. It's Lynn Grove mostly in New Creek. Grove. Yep. So we have to think about that, that in elementary school. You know, the, how many students are in each elementary and all of that. I mean, we may have some zone or um, yeah. yeah. Do we have land? Do we have yes, land we up do. there? We do. Yeah. We have land right next to Boulder Peak. Yeah. We also have land east of Highway 13. So we have a couple of options. We have a couple um, places in the yeah. eastern section. <coughs> anyway, that that was the main thing. Other than that, we're be good. so lonely out there anymore. Please. It won't be as lonely. <laughs> <Still lonely. laughs> All right. Uh, I'll turn it over to Shannon for a superintendent's update. A quick update for you tonight. Um, first of all, the stadium turf is in the process of being installed. You may have seen some pictures on social media yeah. in my Friday memo as well. Uh, I'm seeing really nice progress there um, over the course of the last week, which has been much awaited. Um, so we, right now, we actually are anticipating that they will be done by this Friday, hopefully. Uh, which would give our oh, yeah. teams and the band opportunity to practice and be on the field before um, homecoming the following Friday. So hopefully the pace will continue, but as of right now, that's where we, um, that's where we stand. So um, better late than never, but at least it's, it's making good progress. So oh, quick comment, if you haven't seen it, drive around it, go in there, it's, it's impressive. It looks I did really on nice. Thursday. Cool. And yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It, it is. It's all green and very nice, and Red. I'm hoping that the, the very loud banging when I arrived was them putting something in place. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think the very loud banging is the bridge that they're working on installing oh, as part of the trail. Dreams. So we don't want banging right now on the turf. They're past the banging stage. I was thinking like the <laughs> so, goalposts and all the stuff on the edges. They have so. cut anyway, I don't know. Um, no, that's that, great, yeah. and I did drive by it. It does look really nice. Um, so That'll be really nice for the Saturday with being homecoming. I've been asked to give the class of 82 or a tour, so that will be something for them to see along with the aquatic center. So that will be nice. a lot of fun. We'll guarantee by this Friday, yep, but we still feel um, that gives us a little bit of cushion in case things do get delayed this week for some reason. So, so that was encouraging. Um, one other thing I want to bring up to the board as well, um, even though the school year is just starting, it's time for us to start thinking about early separation for our certified staff members. Uh, because by board policy, uh, there are two key dates we have to keep in mind. The first one is October 12th, um, where if staff are interested in asking for early separation, they have to notify us of their general intent. Um, that doesn't mean they will necessarily retire um, or take early separation, but that's when they have to um, express their intent. And then January 12th is the other key date, and that is the time that they have uh, to make a final decision at that point, if they are going to retire and accept early separation if we offer it. Um, that's the deadline there. So we kind of work backwards from those two dates. Um, we, In a perfect world, we'd love to tell staff, yes, we're able to offer it this year, or no, we're not able to. Um, and we've been talking a lot, um, uh, Dave, Carla, and myself about it. Is it there's two main factors of early separation. Um, that, is there a financial benefit for us to offer it um, is the first one. And is there a financial reason for us to consider it? And then the second piece is, what's this going to do to our staffing numbers? As you just heard Carla talk about, we have our positions filled for certified staff for almost 100%, uh, but we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we create more vacancies than we can fill. Um, on the flip side of that, if we know who's retiring early by January 12th, that gives us a much bigger window to uh, begin the hiring process and uh, move forward there as well instead of later in the springtime. So, so those are factors we're looking at. 
Um, I bring this up to you right now to basically say we need more information at this point before we can make a, a true educated recommendation to you to offer it or not. Um, so what we are planning to do is, um, Carl and I are working on language, we'll send out to staff that are eligible for early separation this year, tell them at this stage we don't have the data um, necessary to make that decision, but we are going to ask them to submit their interest, if they have it, what their level of interest is by October 12th, let them know that date um, as well. Um, it doesn't hold them to anything at all, it just gives us another piece of data for us to look at and decide. Um, and then once we have that information, combine that with Dave's end of year fiscal report and initial fiscal numbers for us. Once we get our certified enrollment after October 1st, all those factors come into play. Then we'll have much more data to bring to you with a solid recommendation of yes, we offered or no, we do not this year. So, um, so we want to be careful. We want to be fiscally responsible, as Barry was kind of alluding to earlier. Um, we also want to be very um, planful in that process as well. So that's where it stands right now. Uh, I'd be glad to take any questions you have about that. There's nothing the board needs to do at this point. Um, we're just going to share information with staff, let them know where we stand, and then take questions from them and ask for their interest level um, at this time then too. I would anticipate probably another month, um, and then we'll have enough information. We want to make sure we have that headcount day um, really firm up and finalized with the state and know where we stand budget-wise as well, um, and then come back for a recommendation for you at that time. So. I um, just want to give you an update, especially for our newer board members. You haven't been through this piece of the, the process yet either, but it's an important one for us to think about um, from a budget standpoint and a, a, just a staffing standpoint as well. So any questions on that before I cover a couple other things? I beat that horse pretty good, I must have then. You didn't have any questions. So, um, Two last things. One, you may not have seen the email I sent this afternoon, um, but the, the lawsuit that we are involved in, the judge did um, deny that request for to grant a preliminary injunction. So I just want to make sure you are aware of that. Um, you may not have seen that news yet this afternoon. Um, and then the final thing is a copy of it on your desk, I believe. The Gazette did a really nice article on our Compass program, front page coverage of the Gazette today. Um, was really a nice piece to highlight. Um, the kids and the staff in that program that do amazing things down there to um, ensure every kid is successful to, uh, to do that. So Grace King had reached out this summer asking for ideas and we were excited that she was really interested in covering that. So she came on Friday, Thursday, Friday, one of the days last week and uh, put that together for us as well. So It was nice that it made front page too. I was surprised to see yeah, the front the page piece. That, was, that, was that nice. looks really so. well, good. It deserves it. That's a great Very front page so. photo. I mean, yeah, yeah. it so. is good. It's great. Anything else? That's it for me. Any questions for Shannon? Next up, ISB, proposed bylaw amendment. So uh, I did go to the Q&A <coughs> last week, and it was more people wanting to listen. There weren't a whole lot of questions. Um, there were a few. Uh, I shared with you the, some screenshots, and that's in front of you for reference as well, on uh, you know just some of the thoughts that came back. They did a really good job of really explaining the proposal and the reasons why they're requesting. I know one person, uh, I don't know what district he was from, but you know he was really concerned about it being a special session and not waiting until November. And you know we just voted on this last year and. Uh, I thought they did a really nice job of explaining that, you know, it's not just that we, the fees are due to NSBA before the November delegation, it's that if we don't pay them, we're in there, then they're in violation of the bylaws, which is not what they would like to do. They want to hold true to what the members expect of them and uphold those bylaws. So I do appreciate the re that reasoning. Um, so. They did outline the, the concerns, which we've talked about before. They provided some reflections on NSBA. Uh, I would say that the, the consensus is that NSBA is not going to be around much longer. If, any, like, if a few more states pull out, they're just not going to be financially stable. So um, there was also you know, the sincere wish from ISBA Executive Council that committee that at some point they do want to work to reunify all of the states, whether that be under NSBA or COSBA. If, if NSBA doesn't exist, that's going to make that hard, so it would probably be COSBA. I don't know. Um, they did provide a slide on their reflections on uh, the new organization, COSBA. 
They do feel that there's a high level of commitment from the member states that have founded it, um, a great desire to create a strong organization and to do that quickly. There's not a lot of information out there yet, as we discussed last time. Uh, they have only been officially founded since I want to say last spring was the official, like all the paperwork went through. So they are very new. There's not a lot out there, but they're putting together conferences and things. Um, one question that came out of our discussion last time was what does their proposed advocacy look like? I did get those copies of the proposed position statements. These are still drafts, so the language could change. Um, but they are looking at just these five topics, not a giant book of everything that's wrong with education that should be addressed, but focusing on, and I know that was one thing we talked about. Um, I do want to point out that one of the areas we have talked about is federal advocacy for special education funding, and that has a position statement. <coughs> they do want to talk about that. Um, so child nutrition is also on here, which is something that we've talked about, the funding issues before. So, um, so with that, that's kind of my summary. I'm not going to make a recommendation. I don't have one. I want to hear what everyone else thinks, and then I will take that forward tomorrow and vote the way you tell me to vote. So um, I will. I guess one more thing I'll say is I did ask about staying neutral for a year, because we had talked about waiting and seeing how COSBA comes forward before we jump into that. Uh, there's very strong feelings from the leadership of the executive staff that ISB only has 20 some employees and it would be very difficult. They're not equipped to do that kind of advocacy on their own. Whereas some of the neutral states like California, I believe is the one she said, they have 220 employees. They're more equipped to do that on their own for a, a period of time than, than our group is. Um, so that was part of the concern with not staying independent and, and doing a wait and see. So questions you guys have, thoughts? Two questions. Uh, my first is, can you clarify or remind me of what, I know that they are working on developing a, or a state and or national training for COSBA. Um, if we drop our affiliation with the National Association, will IASB still have a conference and will we still have access to their resources that we had been utilizing for, um, that we had been able to like log into some online trainings and things like that. Will, we, will those still exist in the same way that they have in the past or were some of those resources from the National Association for School Boards? Conference will definitely stay. I mean, ISB, they're gonna have their full functionality. Okay. That doesn't, ISB is not tied to <coughs> NASB in that way. So <coughs> ISB will exist in very much the same way okay. that it does today. Uh, they, the biggest takeaway I had from that conversation was they rely on the national organization for the national information, for access to other states. When they wanna talk to another state about, hey, how did you address this? They can do that through the national membership. And all of the states that they most frequently talk to are no longer members of NSBA, so they don't have access to those states anymore. They could call them individually, but they don't have the national membership so connection. There's no training that we would lose no. that you're aware of by, by Not, leaving no. that organization. Okay, so that was my question one. And then question two was, uh, I lost it, come back to me. Say thank you, Britt, for for doing what you're doing for the board. You were asked to and you've done it very well. I read through these um, statements that they you said were drafts. I think they give a pretty clear picture of um, that it is well thought out organization at this time. I'm hoping that um, we could get more information, but I think we have to make some decisions I'm not being able to access um, information for the people, the 20 people that work and need to be able to talk to others. I think that's a big reason why we might want to go with the new organization. Um, I'm, I'm just as a couple others are a little skeptical. I 
I think change is hard, but sometimes we have to go for it because we know that what, what we have been doing is not working. And that's what I, I get the sense from everything I've read and everything that we were sent, it makes it sense to move on to something else. So. Yes, the, my, two cents. my feelings is that it's pretty clear that the national is going to fade away and the numbers are down. And in COSBA, with the articles that you sent us and that we could read, you know, really kind of hit right on line with what we've been talking about. You know, they emphasize uh, special needs, um, you know, student learning, uh, mental health. I mean, all, all the things that we have been sitting here and talking about as far as moving forward and how important it is. And then you look at the deficits that we have with, um, you know, some of our, our program that deals with <coughs> special needs. And yet, this is one of their priorities. Um, if you got something that's going downhill and it's going rather quickly, I would, you know, IASB, you know, is going to be there to help us. I, it's kind of like Sandra said, uh, it, it's a tough decision, but I see COSBA doing the things that are important to our district and to the state of Iowa. At least that's that's the way I interpreted what what I read with the the things that came out. Uh, I, uh, I one of my biggest apprehensions uh, to the change was um, this other entity, Casba, and and what they would do, and if it was a good idea for IASB to to just jump right in and join on them. Um, the the five points that they put out. Uh, helped alleviate that a little bit. Um, I think those five points, if those are the five points of focus, um, gives me a little bit more of a warm fuzzy. Um, the, I believe the way this is written, that this will now give IASB the opportunity to pull out of that organization as well much easier than this round with um, NSAB. So with all that being said, I am much more um, on board with it now, seeing that extra information that came out and what IASB has supplied and why, um, I think it, it makes a lot of sense um, to, to approve uh, uh, that vote. So just a reminder, the vote itself is simply changing the bylaw wording that we, we do not require ISB to be a member of NSBA and we allow them, the board of directors, to determine national association. So we're not actually voting for COSBA, but if we approve the bylaw change, it looks like they will go ahead and do that right afterwards. Right. So I know one question we had was, can we amend it so that membership has a say in that? I did ask that question. There was some hesitancy there. Um, the only people that can make a proposed amendment to the amendment are ISB board members, so it would be up to one of them. Um, so we have to decide, do we want to vote for the language as it is, or do we only want to vote for it if they change the language and allow members to have a say in joining a new organization? Those were kind of our two options last time we talked. Those were kind of the things we had discussed. Um, I just want to be very clear when we make this decision, what we're, what we're deciding based on our previous conversations as well. Brent, I, I, you have one more question, go I ahead. I do, but that's okay, go no, ahead. Go, no, go ahead, then I'll. Um, my other question is, I think that position statements are helpful, but I think that they are a very preliminary starting point. Um, we can believe all we want, but if there's no action plan for how we're going to move from this is what we want to this is how we're going to get what we want, then position statements are rendered useless. So I'm really curious to know, does COSBRA have a plan for how they're going to move these position statements into action or at least a structure in place to allow themselves to move them forward? Do they have the staffing in place or a plan for getting the staffing in place or an advocacy plan or something other than 
this is what we want, this is what we believe. So, like, uh, that's the piece that's making me <laughs> nervous. So these five are a huge step forward in information because uh, I had to specifically, these are not public, I had okay. to specifically say, our board needs this information to vote solidly. Like, we're not comfortable not knowing anything. Um, this is all that's out there right now. They are fully founded. All of the paperwork, you know, they mm -hmm. uh, officially exist. They do have some staff. Uh, ISB executive committee indicated that they anticipate it growing. Um, that they, you know, as the organization grows, they'll grow that staff. Uh, in terms of how advocacy would work, one of the questions I asked was, you know, how influential the founding states, like what is the ed educational advocacy going to be, look like? Mm -hmm. And they really feel like COSBA is the best bet because the majority of state representatives are now member, are now from states that are COSBA members as opposed to NSB members. And so there would be more influence there. I don't necessarily 100% get on board with that theory because just because you're from a state that is part of an organization doesn't mean you're going to listen to that organization. And they didn't exist a year ago, so is someone really, how, how seriously are they going to be taken? Mm -hmm. that's, that's where I would fall, but if NSBA doesn't exist anymore, then no one else, I mean, they're gonna be the only ones talking. How that all works yet to be determined. There isn't a plan that is shareable yet. Um, I was really happy that I got position statements, to be quite honest. That was, it's like the most that I could get. So it's all a big question mark. It's part of the risk of joining at the founding level is that you don't know what it's gonna look like because they don't, they're still building it. So it's, it's a, <clears throat> you know, I won't reiterate everything I've said already. I. I um, don't have an in infrastructure yet. There's no way they have an infrastructure yet um, to take those statements and move them into action. It, I think it's going to take a while. And I, I guess I also find it concerning that it took you so much digging. Um, in order to find that. And I, no, I, I do, wouldn't, it didn't take digging. I just had to ask the right question of the right person who could get me the information. They were very, Lisa is the head of ISB, and as soon as I asked for them during the Q&A, right, she emailed I'm not, them over. No, I'm not suggesting that they've done anything okay. untoward. What I'm saying is that it's not like readily available that you can Google search it is a little bit well, concerning they're not finalized yet. to me. Like they're, these, these are still draft. When they're finalized before the legislative session, then they would be published for members to look at. Are these, I'm talking about the um, advocacy that COSBA is saying yeah, that they want to do. those are draft position statements. They're not finalized yet. By um, COSBA? By COSBA. Well, that's yeah. concerning too. I mean, we don't even have, we don't even have a finalization of what they want to do. I mean, that's, I guess that's a little concerning to me. But um, I also think it's a little alarmist. I don't think, NSBA is going to um, go down in a ball of flames tomorrow. Um, I'm just, you know, I continue to be concerned that we're moving towards something that's untested. And I think, um, I think, give it another year and and let's see if they are able to implement the kind of infrastructure that enables them to um, to move that mission statement forward toward actual. Um, or le legislative action. So that's my position. Yeah, I, I have three or four thoughts, if that's okay. The yeah. first one is, Britt, you, seriously, you spent a lot of time on this. This is a lot of work. All the information you've given us, in my she, opinion, has helped me, because I've studied this in great detail. The mm -hmm. only thing I didn't do that I wanted to do was spend some time with Jim Green one-on-one -on -one and was not able to do it. But I have the utmost respect for the IASB board I have the respect for them as a group. I feel like they're going to lead us the right direction because I think there's just a little bit of stuff going on that we haven't been real happy with all in all. So I, you know, I guess I don't want to shut down discussion necessarily, but, but I personally want to make a motion to approve the ISB proposed budget bylaw amendment regarding national membership. As and is? That's correct. And that's just my opinion. 
because I really feel go in the right direction. I agree with Rachel that there are some slight concerns, but we have to have a little bit of faith in our leadership taking us that direction. That's my opinion. So. Is that a motion? That's a motion. Second. We have a motion by Barry and a second by Matt to ex approve the proposed bylaws as written. We'll get, I just want to clarify that gives the board the decision. We're not attempting an amendment or anything like that. We're going to vote yes to accept the amendment as proposed. We'll open it for further discussion if there is any. I think we're you know, we're, we're giving the, um, the IASB board the ability to make that decision. I think they are well informed. They know the problems that they've been, that have arisen working with the national group. Um, we are asking for the change in the bylaw for them to make the decision for us. They could decide to go with this group this year and after working with them for a year, decide another year to, to go with someone else or go back to the national if it continues. So there again, like I said, change is hard, but sometimes we have to give trust in someone, I guess. That's all I want to say. And I think that the, the state board would, like you said, be. I echo that, and I think that I know as much as I know, and I have the concerns of the unknowns, um, but ISB board is much more closely and intimately involved in this than I will probably ever be, and so um, I am putting my vote of confidence in what they believe is going to be best for our state. A lot of people have said this already, but I also want to say thank you for all the work you did on this. It's certainly save a lot of time uh, doing some research. So I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's important. So yeah. um, do you have anything? I was just going to say, you know, IASB is, you know, takes a look at all of the state of Iowa and they have the people in place that can analyze everything as it proceeds. And uh, that's where my faith is, is, is with that board. I think so. And um, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, last year, I did vote no at the delegate assembly because there wasn't information and there wasn't a lot of, I was very concerned about leaving the national organization and what that would mean for our access. Um, and it wasn't proposed like this last year. We didn't have to have a discussion. It just came up at the assembly. And so I, I went with my gut after asking questions. Uh, and so when it came back up, I will firmly admit that I didn't really want to leave NSVA. I, kind of wanted to stick through it and there's so much more information this year and I still don't feel confident that it's the right thing to do whether to leave or to join so I have to put my faith in those that are having those conversations and that are elected to represent all of our school boards and so I'm going to agree uh, with all of you and say that we should approve it and then just be really you know, just watch what happens and analyze it and be very communicative with ISB. If it doesn't look like it's going the way we think it should, we need to communicate with our directors going forward. So. Board president lives right down the street. I can drive you to his house. We probably know how to find him if we need to ask a question. We'll just all go uh, camp out on his lawn if we're not happy. <laughs> so with that, I will, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, tomorrow night, motion carries, and tomorrow night I will vote to uh, approve the bylaws on behalf of the board, and thank you for 
all of that good discussion. Moving on to new business. Fundraising request as provided in Exhibit 601.1. Second. A motion by Rachel, a second by Melissa. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I move to approve the open enrollment request as presented. Second. Motion by Barry and a second by Clark. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. A motion by Melissa and a second by Rachel. Any discussion? Um, I just got one quick thing. On uh, 704.5, the agreement with Tech Upbeat, um, I just wanted to, since I did have uh, a question or two myself and um, someone else had asked, I did reach out to Shannon and, and, and ask what that was um, based on the, the amount of that contract of 20 whatever thousand dollars that is. Um, and I, I think it would if Shannon, if you don't mind, could explain kind of what that survey is asking for and what the, the um, purpose of it is, um, just to give a little direction. I'd be I glad appreciate to. appreciate that. Yep. Um, going back several weeks ago now, I guess it was, in my conversation about goals, uh, one of the areas we really wanted to focus on was um, just making sure we have a good handle of our workplace satisfaction as far as um, staff morale, retention, those type of areas. Um, so Carla and I talked shortly after that, um, and she had some connections out there as far as companies she was aware of that could help in those areas. Um, everything from opportunities to hear from staff through surveys, um, different coaching, different different levels of support with that. Um, so she kind of did, filtered through several different options, and then we met with um, this group Upbeat um, via Zoom as well to hear kind of their formal presentation, what they had, and we really came away impressed with, um, it's not just a survey. Um, it's a survey of all of our staff, though, to start with, of certified and classified, pretty thorough survey as far as their workplace um, culture and where their level of satisfaction is. And then with the piece that I think really sold us on it was uh, they take all that data, they analyze it, and then they break it down for us into a dashboard that gives us full access to um, any information we can. It's still confidential for the individual as far as breaking it down by building department, those type of things, and then obviously full district data. And then the other piece that was kind of a tipping point for us for this group was um, they also then take that data when it's completed and then they schedule individual coaching conversations with us as district leaders, as, as a cabinet, but then also with each building uh, principals as well as far as here's what your building data shows, um, here's some highlights, here's things for you to consider. Um, they don't tell them what to do, but they just help break that data down um, and then we can start to put that into action steps going forward then too. So. Um, so we think it's a, a really a, a pretty cool opportunity to really get some great data for across the board from all of our staff. Um, it's really it's not part of our strategic plan, but it fits really well with it and aligns with the, making sure we're here from everybody and how we want to continue to grow as a district. So, uh, so that's kind of the longer version of what I told Matt earlier today. Um, but the, we can be really impressed with what they can offer. Um, and excited to see where that can take us. So any other questions you have on that, I'd be glad to uh, glad to respond. I appreciate, I appreciate you letting, letting us know and talking me, in, uh, talking me through that one. Um, and, uh, and the public, I'm sure, appreciates that as well. And I appreciate that you asked Shannon ahead of time so that you, know, you understood and he could tell us all again. Um, if it's a concern for you, it's probably a concern for others. So that's important to, but I'm glad that you said something ahead of time to me. What well, I'll say about the contract when Shannon told me about it last week was uh, I really like the idea that all of our building administrators will get to sit down with someone and work through the data and come up with a plan. Like that, when you just have data, that's great, but having someone talk you through what to do with it is a great step, and I think that that is on point with the goals that we've set. So, um, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, board communications. Got a lot of stuff coming up. October is going to be busy with strategic planning. We shared some dates with you guys last time on the community conversations. Um, the request I think uh, we'd like to make is that if each board member can pick one of the three dates in addition to the state of the district, that will give everyone coverage and then you only have to go to one meeting. We don't want the whole board at every meeting. So 
October 11th, October 17th, and October 26th, if each of you could pick one of those dates and we'll try and have. What were the dates again, Britt? The 11th, the, the, the 17th, and you. the 26th. We can send out a communication okay, you on that as well. You don't have to do it right well, now. So I just wanted to share that that's. Um, 17th. Oh, 26th. let's see. Matt, you have the next Marion City Thank Council you. meeting. Uh, can I get a volunteer for October 6th? I can do that one. I'd like to have those a couple, a little bit ahead of time, um, especially since October is going to be really busy. And then our first board visit. Um, is going to be the 29th at Hazel Point. I know Sandra will be your second board visit. But, <laughs> yes, it uh, will. I practice. But yeah, the 29th, so just make sure you can let Gala know on those if you're going to be able to attend. Uh, and then we have some committees that are going to be meeting. So October and the rest of September are going to be busy, as it should be in the fall. Uh, I don't have anything else. I, have a oh, I don't. Go ahead. First, let me just chant, I appreciate I just want to end the meeting in a real high note, I feel because we, we want to make sure we understand exactly what we're here for. This Compass article this morning <laughs> in the paper was awesome. Mm -hmm. Second item, I went to three assemblies uh, a week or two ago for the honor students and, and our sophomore class, which got the award as freshmen, was the largest <laughs> class we've ever had receiving an honor award which was awesome. Of course, I was happy to be there because my granddaughter was in the group. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Why and this is the just real story. Another positive. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. That auditorium just can't handle it. So just <laughs> take note. Yep. We're jammed in there like you wouldn't believe. But and I'm, I'm not, a plug? Not, but that, <laughs> is that a plug? <laughs> <laughs> the other, well, it's, For still, the it's still money. So For sorry. the future. <laughs> and then the last one was, of course, the discussion we had a, a few weeks ago. and. My granddaughter grabbed her dad's cell phone this afternoon to thank me for bringing Joe in to speak. She said that was an awesome session. It was an unbelievable session. And the number of, I've had a couple parents reach out to me as well. So it sounds like it went well. And I think at 6 o'clock there was a parent, parent session going, going on right now. Yeah. So anyway, schools tomorrow. all of those items on a positive note, the school district is off and running. Things are moving along. And the opportunities are out there. So just keep moving. So. We'll say Clark and I were lucky enough. Our meeting with Shannon ended right as the graduation was going to happen. So we got to go down and impromptu cool. got to yeah. participate and do the high five line and the cheering. And that was my first Compass hallway graduation. And it's awesome. I, I love that program. <laughs> I think special things happen in this building, all of our buildings, but there are some yeah. special things happening in the Compass program. And to, for it to hit front page, I'm really glad that she was able to come and see that. Yeah, and we got to congratulate her even afterwards when she was leaving the building. Yeah. We got to talk to her for a few minutes, and that was really nice. One thing I want to say is don't forget this Thursday is dying out for schools. So tell them, tell them you know, you want the money to go to Linmar and uh, help us out. So if you can have all three meals, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Any, anything else for the good of the cause? Move to adjourn. Second. All right, so I have a motion by Barry and a second by Melissa to adjourn at 648. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks.